time we will be talking all about our kinds and before we proceed I highly recommend that you must have watched the first part of the reactions of our kinds. That is because most of the reactions of alkynes are also patterned after the reactions of alkenes. In fact, in this recording, I will not anymore discuss the basic principles of the mechanism of electrophilic addition. We will just get straight into it. So if you feel like you need to brush up on that, go back to our discussion on alkenes. But if you are now ready, then let's start. Now, there is only one big difference between an alkyne and an alkene, and that is the fact that alkynes, the fact that they have a triple bond, have an extra pi bond versus a double bond. Remember that the composition of a double bond is one sigma and one pi. So that means that there's only one pi bond in an alkene, right? And that means that if you use up that single pi bond, which we always have been doing so far in our reactions of alkenes, the moment that that one bond or that pi bond is gone, then you cannot react anymore. But the fact that in my triple bond, there are two pi bonds, that means that whatever I can do in our alkenes, we can do in our alkynes two times. So that means you can do the same alkene reaction twice given the triple bond has an extra pi bond. So for example, let's start with one. Let's get straight ahead. Isn't it that when you say that we have hydrogenation, it means addition of hydrogen? So initially, if you have a triple bond, if I have H2, the normal route right, is you would remove a pi bond. So if you remove one bond from a triple, that will only give you a double bond, which we, have, we, we see here, only a double bond. And then, of course, we know that H2 will be divided into two pieces of H, which we attach to the two vinylic carbons. So that means that after one round of hydrogenation, an alkyne can become, you have a double bond, right? An alkene. But of course, we know that if we have an alkene, we can add another mole of hydrogen, so that fully my double bond is a single bond so I can go all the way to become an alkane. So that means if I actually use not just one but two molecules of H2, my alkyne or triple bond can jump all the way to a single bond. Now, there is a catch here. Do you know that the common route or the common thing that actually happens is that an alkyne goes straight to a to an alkane. That's right. Meaning, we usually do not stop at just a double bond. Now, what if we just want to end with a double bond? Meaning, hey, I don't want to jump to a single bond. I don't want a single bond. I want only a double bond. Can you allow me to do that? And the answer is yes, you may. But if you use a special type of catalyst, the catalyst that you should use if you want to convert a triple to a double bond is something that we call a Lindlar's catalyst. This is actually similar to the metal catalysts that we were using before in hydrogenation. It's just that the Lindlar's catalyst is weaker. That's why it's weak enough such that you only stop at a double bond and you don't go on a rampage and go straight ahead to a single bond. Okay? So that's the use of the Lindlar's catalyst, triple to double. Next, we have halogenation, and as this states, you add the halogen. So if you have a double bond, of course, after adding X2, that will become a double bond. And as usual, X2 will give you two separate pieces of X that you will attach separately as well. Now, since you still have a double bond, that means you can add another mole of X2 such that not only do you have only two molecules of X in this product, remember you added two more, so you can have as much as four halogens in our product. So, I mean, you can call that a tetrahyl, you can probably call this a tetrahalide if you want to, which is the most sensical term because it means four halogens, right? So there. Next. Hydrohalogenation means I'm going to add H, X, right? Hydrogen and halogen. We know, as usual, the triple bond, one of it will be used up, it will become a pi bond, and then 
one will get the h of the hx, the other vinylic carbon will now have the x of the hx. Now, this is interesting. What if I add another mole of hx? So remember, at the moment, I already have one h at one and one x. The h is at the left, the x is at the right. So now the question is, I'm going to add another mole of hx. Do I add my other h also here? Or do I put my h on the other side? Similarly, do I add my x here also? Or do I put it now on the other side? And actually, in order to help us, let us go back to one of the definitions of the Markovnikov's rule, way back here. Remember, one of the definitions states that the H is added to the carbon with more Hs. So, if we go back here, isn't it that between this left and right carbon, the carbon with more Hs is the one at the left because it is the only carbon with the H. And the Markovnikov st rule states that you add the H to the carbon with more H. So meaning from this HX, you will add this H to the same carbon which had the, the H a while ago also. And in that case, the X from the second HX will go to the carbon that also held the X a while ago. So that means for the first time, you have a single carbon that holds both exact substituents. Remember before, in our discussion of alkenes, when we have something where I have two exact things on carbons that are beside each other, we call that bisonal. But those are two separate carbons still. But here, when you go to our example, our two halogens are literally attached to just one solitary carbon. So that's not anymore bisonal. It's not adjacent carbons. It is the same exact carbon. In that case, of course, I know if I have two X's, I, sorry, I'm, I, I actually messed this up. I have two X's, we know the product is a dihalide. But instead of vicinal, the word that we will use here is the word geminal. So remember this term from now on. When you say geminal, it means that I have two things that are attached to the exact same source. It's as if they are the same, they come from the same source. It's as, it's as if they're twins. But you have to know, the reason why you call it Geminal, it comes from the constellation Gemini, the twins. So, yeah, the product here is a Geminal dihalide, a carbon with both the halogens on it. Next, hydration means addition of water. Although, take note that if we're going to perform hydration on alkynes, you need a special catalyst called HgSO4. Okay, But not to worry about this because the same protocol will proceed. We know that if you split water into two, you get one H and another molecule of OH. And then, of course, um, as usual, the triple bond will be a double bond after the reaction. One carbon will get the H, and then one carbon will get the OH. And now, at this point, look at this closely and notice that it has two functional groups. It has a double bond. And at the same time, it has an OH group. So it's like it's an alkene, right? Alkene, double bond. It's an alkene and an alcohol at the same time. And we call such molecules enols. Alkene, alcohols. And now, what you have to know about enols is that actually enols are relatively unstable because of the reason that if we like remove a lot of this mess, if we go back to the structure, Think about this. Your oxygen is an electronegative atom. It likes electrons. So if oxygen will really loving electrons, shouldn't it be the one which would have the most bonds? But it's not the case. In fact, the bond of oxygen is only the single bond. And the double bond here is given to the carbons which are not actually the electron demanding atoms. Right? Carbons are not electronegative, so the question is like, why are you giving the double bond to the carbons when the carbons don't really like too much electrons? Therefore, I'm trying to say here, in order to make this stable, give away this double bond to our oxygen so that it would be a better fit. Such that, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna make some sort of exchange. So what did I just say? So give the double bond to the oxygen, so like that. Oh, don't forget to copy this here. 
Now, if I give my double bond to the oxygen, something is wrong with this structure. We should know that standard oxygen has two bonds. At the moment, my oxygen here has three. And th that means that that H right here at the upper right corner should be removed. And we're going to place that H to the other carbon. Meaning there's a rearrangement wherein the double bond goes here, but the H of this OH goes to the other carbon. Such phenomenon is called the total merization process. Toto merization. Oh, and by the way, isn't it that you produced a carbonyl group? In traditional chemistry, we call this form of our product the keto form. So this is the enol form, the one you're seeing here, and this is the keto form. That's why a lot of textbooks give the complete word keto enol totamerization. However, do not be, do not be, uh, let's say, uh, how do I say it? Do not be misled by this. It doesn't mean that both enol and keto forms are equally existent. The keto is much more stable than the enol form. Therefore, the final product is usually the keto form as it never goes back to the enol state. Okay, so take note of that. Now, I want you to focus on this particular alkyne. So we have, we have this one, and I'm subjecting the same alkyne to two different reagents, and I, I, I want you to notice what's the difference. One is addition of water, one is hydroboration. Now, remember this, what's, so, what's common about hydration and hydroboration? Wasn't it that hydration produced alcohols and hydroboration also produced alcohols? So actually, they both produce alcohols. So what is the only difference between them? It's the fact that the normal hydration process follows the Marconikov's rule, but hydroboration is actually an anti-Marconikov reaction. So what am I trying to say here is that although I will add an OH to both my products, the position of the OH would be at different places. For example, these are my two options on where to put my OH. Isn't it that this carbon is primary, this carbon is secondary, and following the Marconikov's rule, we are bound to put our OH here. And after tautomerization, remember what happens is that the double bond here would be gone, I would now give it to my oxygen, and then this H will also be removed. So in this case, my product after hydration is actually a ketone, R, C, O, R, right? But now, look at this. What if I perform hydroboration? Remember, hydroboration affords you an alcohol that is anti-Marconikov, meaning when I expect to put my OH here following Marconikov's, hydroboration will disobey that and instead we put our OH here. And so, what would happen is that, again, after tautomerization, this double bond will be gone, and then the double bond will be shifted to my oxygen. So, it will now be double bond O. And isn't it that this is our final product? Isn't it that this is an aldehyde? So, there is something that you can pick up from here. One is that tautomerization can actually give you carbonyl compounds like ketos and aldehydes. And two... It really depends on what type of hydration you did so as to reach the ketone or aldehyde products. If you use the good old hydration and you follow the Marconikov's rule, the Marconikov's enol will give you the ketone. However, if your enol here is one which is anti-Marconikov because of an anti-Marconikov reaction like hydroboration, it will most likely give you an aldehyde. Okay? So that's it for hydration of alkynes. One more reaction for alkynes that is exclusive to alkynes is acetylide formation. To give you a clue, remember that when the suffix of a word or a chemical is "-ide", it usually denotes a negative charge, right? Sulfide, chloride, bromide, iodide, negatively charged molecules. So, how do we start? First, take note that our requirement is an alkyne that must have at least one hydrogen beside the carbon holding the triple bond. I'm trying to say here that for number five, if for example you have an alkyne wherein your triple bond is beside or sandwiched between two carbons, 
This one is ineligible for acetylide formation. You must have H beside one of those triple bonded carbons. Why? Because if I have that H with me, I can use a reagent called sodium amide. So this NaNH2 is called sodium amide. And the sodium amide would actually have its sodium replace that H. So in short, if there's no H there, there's nothing to replace. That's why it's important. So anyway, as I have said, this H will be replaced, it will be gone, and after the reaction, the H will now become our Na. And now here's the catch. Remember that in the periodic table, sodium is at the very left side of the table, and carbon, although we don't recognize carbon as electronegative, at least compared to, you know, oxygen or halogens, in this case, carbon is actually far more electronegative than any metal like sodium. And since carbon is more electronegative than sodium, we now see a partial negative charge on our carbon. And that is the reason why we have the word acetylide. In short, an acetylide is actually just an alkyne that bears a negative charge like this. Okay? Now, we can use an acetylide an ion in order to do something. And that is, if I add Rx, which is an alkyl halide, let us try to match the correct charges to one another. So, first, I have here my R. My R here is partially positive, and therefore, it should look for the negative thing on the other reagent. And this is the negative, right? So the ones that will attach are this carbon with the triple bond and this R from Rx. Conversely, or complementary to that, my sodium, which is positive, is a perfect match for the X here, which is negative. Therefore, the Na at the end of the reaction will bind with X, giving us the byproduct NaX. But what happened to the R? Oh, yeah, that's right. I just told you a while ago, the R from Rx will now attach to this carbon with the triple bond, so it should be placed here. And so, my product is actually, guess what? An alkyne. But this time, compared to the original alkyne, Given that I added extra carbons, one thing that we should know is that the alkyne that you now produce here is longer than usual. For example, if my original alkyne has three carbons, and I added the Rx here which has one carbon, then congrats, your, carb your alkyne now has four carbons, right? If I have originally five carbons, and then my Rx contains two, then I have five plus two, my final product is seven. So the purpose actually of reaction number five is to show you how you can strategize or make methods in order to make your chain longer. And that is by using the acetylide.